And welcome everyone. This is Debbie Mabry with National Kitchen and Bath Association. You're here for our very first webinar of the month of December 2020. And uh, the entire month we are featuring architecture and design. And today's session is called Six Pathways to Unlock Your Designs with Richard Landon, who is a certified master kitchen and bath designer. And I also want to thank Gebert for their generous sponsorship for all of our webinars this month. Richard is uh, with Richard Landon Design. I uh, don't have his bio in front of me, but I believe that Richard can tell you a thing or two about himself. So Richard, if you're available, um, I'm going to unmute your line and we're going to get started. Thanks so much. Okay. <clears throat> well, the things that make my mother happy were the fact that I won the best overall kitchen design award in, uh, in the art of the industry. Uh, contest, so that was quite, uh, she finally forgave me for not becoming a doctor. <laughs> uh, I've been published over 70 times, and a lot of the reason why is because of what I'm going to share with you today. And uh, here are the objectives. I want you to learn each of the six interrelated pathways we, we can use to aim design possibilities. I'm also going to give you product selections or ways I modify things that enable these solutions. And uh, we're actually just going to walk through how that happened and we went from before to after. And then underlying all of this, the four guiding principles I use to guide my clients through the unlocking process. When it comes right down to it, uh, you know, if we dive right into this, I walk into a home and I walk through the bedroom. They want to do their bath. On the way through the bedroom, I see this amazing view of the mountain. And I asked myself, where's the view? What just happened? You know, it was totally gone. And I walk around, instead there's just this lovely view of the fence and this spec house never used uh, towel drying tub. And now the after, the view of the forest and mountains revealed. So what did I do? You know, I basically pointed out to them, when you walked in, you have this amazing view then you walk into there, and the first thing I said is, we need a window in this wall. And as you're gonna hear later, of course, their response is, oh, that's gonna cost a lot. And we're gonna find out how I answered that in a little bit. But this, uh, you can see in this, I'm gonna point out a couple little things that you might be uh, wanna adapt for your own work. Notice how I took the tile and inserted some uh, accent tiles in between the tiles on the floor. And also notice how I did a double layer of the countertop to suspend that part where the uh, little makeup center was there at the end. But more importantly, try doing something with back-to-back -back faucets. It's incredibly hard to make it that thin because you need to have the valve in the body of the faucet. And so I'm putting out this particular one just in case you're inspired to do something similar because it's most faucets, the valve uh, assembly is in the wall, and there's no way you could do a back-to-back -back, uh, faucet like this centered uh, one another without uh, having some real issues. So Roll makes particular one with like that, and there may be others. Uh, the tub is Victorian Albert, a Malfi tub. This is a particular tub that is made with volcanic limestone in the resins, and it holds heat really well. And my client said to me, they'd never taken a bath in that uh, jacuzzi tub that was there in all the years they'd lived in the house. But now uh, she comes home and she says, I take a bath two to three, four times a week because it is so comfortable to sit in this tub. This is another problem solver I'm just gonna throw out because many of you may not know about this. This is one of the rare, probably the only two drain tub and it only needs 46 and a half gallons of water to fill. And that's pretty amazing because water has weight. And you may be in a situation with an older home where you, you know, you've you got weight concerns if you add the weight of a tub. Well, this could be your problem solver because it'll save you about two to 300 pounds of weight by using this particular tub. So as I said, there's six pathways you can use to unlock your designs. And I'm gonna show you a different approach to unlocking designs. And I quote from Luc Spacial, uh, who's the chief innovation officer at Lander and Fitch. They have small clients like Visa, Airbus, Renault, and others like that. 
And he says the challenge of creativity is to look at old problems in new ways. And that is the real problem. How do we get out of this rut that often many of us are in? I myself have been in over the years till I developed this approach where you resolve and understand and solve opportunities and challenges, ch challenges in certain ways. Because effectively, most of us come into this business and we learn how to design in order to sell something. And we get to know the products and the cabinets and the appliances in particular that shape our designs. Well, I learned to design to transform, satisfy, and inspire. And in using pathways and the feelings that are evoked by them to shape the design, and then use the products we either fit them into this new design or I adapt them or make them fit the design. And the three primary pathways that shape your layout are pretty obviously view, light, and people. And the secondary ones actually affect materials and finishes quite a bit, sound, smell, and touch. You can see the one, I, it's simplified, I agree. Layout on the one side and product selection on the other, those aren't silos. They do overlap, they do interconnect, and in particular, view and touch inter interact with each other, interact with each other. Uh, the latest findings in neuroscience have discovered that when you look at something, let's say you look at a, a piece of uh, material, cloth, let's say, or a rug, whatever it is, and it has a lot of texture in some way. They now using fMRI, uh, functional magnetic resonance, resonance imaging, uh, they can watch what, which areas of your brain light up. And they discovered that when you look at something, certain areas of your brain light up. And when you touch that same item, the same areas of the brain light up. And I think that's stunning that touch and vision are so interconnected that the same areas of your brain light up. And I think that has a lot of uh, impact on the kind of uh, things we do and the way we approach our material selection. So let's go into another example. A client's wish list was get rid of this post. Well, yeah, it's a big major post. And if I had been locked into what I call wish list design, which is fitting products into the space in order to make a sale, I, I would have done a, this project very differently. But I've developed what I call most matters design. And in most matters design, it's more about serving the client and becoming their advocate. It's a very different approach, different attitude, different atmosphere throughout the process. Conventional selling approach, you know, you go after it has to look great, it has to work well, and oh my gosh, we have to fit it into the budget, you know. There's a whole book on this I'd recommend, Emotional Design by Donald Norman. He was vice president of the Advanced Technology Group at Apple when they developed the iPhone. And this book documents why we love or hate everyday things, but it has a lot to say about what we need to do as designers because great design also evokes emotions. And spaces therefore become meaningful. They're not just pretty or usable. And they, the design makes you feel a certain way. And I have distilled this down initially. It was looks great, works well, feels right. But about two years ago, I came up with these three words. It, you need to transform your space, satisfy you functionally, yet at the same time, I really want you to be inspired emotionally. And I have to say that inspire is what most matters because feelings are timeless. In some of my webinars, people have commented, oh, those designs you're showing us are a little bit outdated or are outdated. And I have to say, if you were in the room, the feeling that you'd be getting would be timeless. And in fact, during the last downturn, kitchens that I'd done and homes that I'd done, some of them were 16, even 20 years old, were selling in the downturn inside of a week with escalation clauses because people came in and they loved how the home felt to them. So chasing emotions and what makes a space feel right to you is what this seminar, this webinar is all about. And this was the genius of Steve Jobs. So 
let's take you through the kind of the conversation. The client says, get rid of that post. First, the top of my wish list for 17 years, I've hated that post. How did I shift her out of that rut? Well, I ask, what about questions? And I would tell you, I would coach you never to ask why questions, because that gives you reasons and justifications that aren't really pertinent, usually budget. But if you ask a what about question, I and I did, what about removing that post is important to you? And she gave me kind of that, like, duh, it's in my face whenever I want to enjoy our views of the water. So I said, well, if that's what matters, then instead of moving the post, what about moving the kitchen? And literally the client froze up. Uh, 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 what? You, you can do that? Uh, yeah. Uh, and it's a lot cheaper than removing a three-story steel post or moving it. And if that's what most matters, I said, if you is what matters, well, what about just moving the kitchen? And, and uh, she said, Let's, I said, let's add two more posts. Remove the wall between the dining room and the kitchen and open up the kitchen to a 180 degree view. And at that point she said, I need to sit down. And this is the kitchen that resulted from that because I didn't move it much. I just moved it forward about three feet where she was standing, but that was enough to position her and to create a feeling these were people who owned a boat and they were boaters, you know, it created the feeling of a bridge. And yeah, th this project is about, hmm, gosh, at least 12 years old. You can see because I've used Sub-Zero 600 series refrigerators and uh, that uh, uh, they don't make those anymore, which is, I think, a great loss. Sub-Zero, if you're listening, <laughs> because I won the award for best kitchen in the nation with one year with these two refrigerators and the very next year, the next winner of the best uh, kitchen in the nation won the award with this, these two refrigerators, a distinctive competency lost. So, but the kitchen, this place will feel right, feel good, feel wonderful for the next decade or more. So let's talk just a bit about wish list design and what drives it and you know, how that affects what most matters. You'll get things like, oh, we have all these irritants in the layout. Uh, the materials, the equipment's update. Well, let's just put it on the wish list. And the budget, which is for all of us, I think our favorite buzzkill. Um, style, oh, this thing is so uh, you know worn out, whatever it is. And you no, know, my husband likes really contemporary. I don't. I really love traditional. I grew up on the East Coast. Love dental molding, all the rest. But we never have enough storage. Never have enough counter space. All these things end up on a typical wish list. So one of the first things I say to people when we want to move them in a new direction is, okay. What I really want to warn you is what matters is not your wish list. And usually they look at me like, what? It's a good thing you warned me with this, uh, I've had people say, because if you hadn't warned me, I'd be saying, you're out of here. If you're not going to do our wish list, why are we even talking to you? And I follow that up with a statement. What matters most is what drove you to make the wish list. Think about that. A wish list is our client's best attempt to resolve the things that are bothering them. And we're supposed to know the industry and have ways of resolving things that they don't know and they can't do what they don't know. So it's really the most important thing we can do as designers is to discover what drove them to make the wish list. And I can tell you that once I've clarified that with them and discovered that, that 100% of the time on my projects, we don't do what was on the wish list. We resolve what actually drove them to make the wish list, and the project takes a completely different direction, as you just saw in that one kitchen with the post. And for doing this, like I have four principles. I'm going to give you three to start. I say to people, because this is going in a different way you didn't expect, or could possibly go in a way you don't didn't expect. First thing, just please commit to staying with this process of discovery as we discover what most matters to you, what drove you to make this wish list. And as we do this, we're gonna throw out ideas. I'm gonna throw out ideas. I may push you on an idea. And, and, and the reason for this is we're attempting to learn what most matters. So the third principle is the way you react to these ideas is going to be information about something that matters. So when you react, if you say, I don't like that, 
I'm going to ask. Remember the question, what about that don't you like? That's an information question. And I, and I cannot emphasize enough how amazing it is when you just change how you ask a question on what happens in the design process and how amazing it is to equalize the participants in the process by saying all ideas are placeholders. So if one of your clients, and usually there's two, you know, dismisses the other one and says, like, I don't like that or that's not a good idea, you can turn around and say, oh, well, what about that isn't a good idea? What about that don't you like? What about that bothers you? One of my classic examples was I designed this great kitchen with the typical eating nook where the two benches faced each other across the table. And the wife said, I don't like that. I don't want that. And the husband says, why? Well, this is awesome. I would love that. And they were just about to blow. So when I finally interjected, and I said, tell me, what about that don't you like? And she said, my mother has that, and I'm not going to have my mother's kitchen. Bingo! So I designed an L-shaped eating nook, and everybody was happy. The marriage was saved which is one reason why when people sometimes you know, ask me what I, I, I do you know, for a living, I say, well, I'm an architect, I'm interior designing, cabinet make, planning and lighting, planning space therapist. And they laugh and they say, oh, that's exactly what we need, a space therapist. So let's walk through this tension in this master bath. And I will tell you, I'm gonna spend quite a bit of time about half of this uh, webinar on view pathways because they're the most common unlock path. Uh, and this was a, uh, a classic example. I walk in, there's a, a big giant mirror, the typical builder's house, the lighting up above the mirror. You, gotta, you had to get in the tub in order to see the view. There's a, in bed, you'd look through the door, you'd see the tub. You didn't even see the view until you got in the tub. When you looked through the doorway, all you saw were some trees, nice, but it wasn't uh, your main view basically with the tub. So I proposed, moving the, the, uh, the door and opening up that wall where the mirror was to be able to look out and see the view. And I had a 3D model showing them that, that they would be able to see out, obviously not the model, that's a screen in the model, just to demonstrate how this would come together. And then we to combine both a contemporary feel with a, this, you know, there's the Amalfi tub again, that classic slipper tub done in a contemporary way and a blending of the old and the new, which you know, might not work for many of you, yet it worked for this client and it feels right to them. And it was a blending of two worlds, her East Coast world and his uh, background had grown up in a place where it was much more contemporary. But notice where the mirror is on the wall. How do you shave at that, that was his side. How do you shave at a sink when your mirror is off to one side? and you're always having to shift your head over. Well, you weld, as you can see in that right-hand drawing, this is a good example of how I modified something to make it work better for the design. I shaped the design first, and then I made the products fit in. And I had a mirror made with a wood um, surround like that, like you saw. We welded two drawer guides together, and he pulls that out in front of the of this sink when he's shaving and he pushes it back when it's done. And that opens up the view paths for when you're in the shower, you can look straight out at the view without having the mirror in the way. And don't be afraid to embrace color. Uh, it adds a tremendous amount of emotion to his space. So what kind of views are there? There's of course the natural ones, but there's also architectural ones like millwork and cabinetry. And so I walked into a home and I go into a master suite. They wanted to talk about how they could get more closet space. They were talking about bumping out the house and, and doing something to have a more closet. They were just desperate. The house was only 1,100 square feet. I walked in, there were clothes piled up on the chair. The bed wasn't made, all the rest. And I, I, I looked around and I thought, hmm. What if I took the wall down between the master bedroom and the adjacent bedroom, not to make that bedroom a closet, but to change that wall into a 12 foot wide built in uh, set of cabinetry. Because I gained four and a half inches in the wall, 
I only needed 15 inches of the bedroom, which meant they actually had more space at the foot of the bed because that was less depth than the bureau that was sitting there. And I only needed six inches of the adjacent room. Well, that also though meant we had to move the door in the other room, which of course cost money. Yet the overall cost of doing this at roughly 25,000 was far less than adding on to the house. And we had doubled up rods here. The drawers were designed to come out to within a quarter inch of the foot of their bed. And then where the closet used to be, here's a product that if you don't know about, it's so really wonderful, I use it all the time. I remove a closet and replace it with an Ikea Pax wardrobe full of all kinds of cool interior goodies. It frees up five inches of floor space. And in a small home of 1100 square feet, that was an amazing amount of floor space to free up at the head of the bed, as you can see there. And in the other room, this is what resulted for the child that lived there. She had a whiteboard and she had books there. And, and uh, those drawers weren't actually drawers in the middle. Those were fake because they were actually drawers on the other side from the master. And this uh, child had actually a bureau there at the foot of the bed. So there's also aesthetic views of art and furniture pieces. So as I walk through one home, I see this wonderful paintings above the fireplace in the living room. And I'm walking back into the area where the kitchen was gonna be, walked back into the living room and I looked at that painting and they said, oh yeah, we love that painting. We picked it up while we were in Italy and we just love it. I said, well, how often do you sit out here in the living room? How questions are also really good. Uh, and they said, oh, we don't ever get out here. So I went over and I took the painting off the wall and I carried it back into the kitchen and I sat it on the one on the existing space, sat it over there against this wall. And I said, this needs to be in the kitchen. It's so important to you. And you can see what that then resulted in is the stair stepping of the, of the cabinetry to reflect the gambrel roof that was above that space. And it spilled out and it began to affect other things as you can imagine. I walked into another home with very, very small kitchen. And the only way to get storage for small appliances was to actually create a furniture piece. The middle section of that, as you can see where those three panels are side by side, that actually folds down. And you can see if you look closely, and I apologize for the quality of the photo. The, there's, uh, this was actually a kitchen that's almost 20 years old. And, and the technology back then wasn't that good. Uh, but I pulled out, you can see the little knob there right there. You can pull those out to land the, that flap down on it. And it was laminated on the back. All the small appliances were there. When you're done, you push them back, you fold it up, bingo, you have your armoire again. You can also see to the left of that armoire, the view, there was a dining room. And when you sat in the dining room, you looked into the kitchen straight at the this big giant box, stainless steel box, that's uh, full of things we're attempting to, to uh, keep from, from dying off on us. A cold box full of things in the process of dying, basically a refrigerator that we're trying to restrain them from that process. And there is actually nothing in our brains hardwired incidentally to associate and respond positively to refrigerators. John Zeisel in his book, Inquiry by Design, uh, he specializes in Alzheimer's, uh, Alzheimer care units, and they've, they've discovered there's eight things hardwired into our brains. And one of those eight things is a positive reaction to basically uh, the cooking center, wherever there's food that's going to come from, in particular, uh, a fireplace, which is why oftentimes when you go into these kind of care centers, there'll be a fireplace in the entry or, in, or near, nearby because that's what people, uh, it triggers a positive response. Oh boy, I'm, I'm gonna get some food if I'm, I'm here. So what did I do to hide that refrigerator? I literally glued some very thin material to the face of the refrigerator and had a faux painter come in and paint it as you see. That was a fun project. So that's an idea for you on how to modify a product uh, to, to make it less noticeable when you're in the dining room, you hardly didn't even notice that as a refrigerator. In another project, we had uh, a bathroom that had to also be a powder room. So I 
figured out how to do the storage, but by doing these two large drawers underneath the vanity with a U-shaped one, obviously, on the upper one, uh, we were able to create enough storage for the things they needed there, relocate other things close by, and turned it into basically an art piece. Uh, we floated it off the wall on a couple of two by fours, put a, a band of light behind it, and then I had a, a glass counter made that has a river-like effect you can see in there. Uh, and we called that Rock and River, and it worked out quite well. On the right, uh, this was a client up in Juneau, Alaska, and I've done about 20 projects up there. And of course, that's an area where you have the Mendenhall Glacier and a lot of snow and ice. So I proposed an ice fall at the end of their island and to make the island sit on an ice cube. And they love the idea, it's actually glass. And uh, you can see the before in that upper left corner. And they got very inspired by this. They wanted more space in the kitchen. We bumped out as far as we could within the property limits, but there wasn't enough room for an island, a typical island. So I decided to propose this art piece to them. They got very excited about it. I would also call your attention to uh, a slight modification that if you're working with a CAD CAM shop, a computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing uh, company, and most of us have access to that, or a custom shop that can do this for you, it's actually very easy to put a 5 8 inch high arc on the bottom of your drawers when they're solid like that. It's just a simple programming step. It cost me $100 for them to reprogram the machinery to do that. That was it. I had to pay for the engineer's time. And I did that because, of course, the home looks out on the water, and you can see how this egg opened up. Well, that ended up being like, I think that was a $20,000 project for that island alone by the time we were done. But they could justify the cost of that because it was it was so spectacular. It was an art piece. They were buying art. They weren't just buying an island for function. They were buying art for their kitchen. Now, they're switched to a light paths. Uh, you can see actually in this how we opened this up to light paths as well. And that's a good way to think about this next section because the hormones that uh, we have in our bodies are actually controlled by the pituitary pineal and uh, pineal, how are you saying that word? Hypo hypothalamus gland. And they're stimulated by light, but just not any light. The daylight with its different moods and colors from different directions. So light from two windows and two walls from two sky colors is just much more pleasant and healthy than just a single window in a room. This has a, a lot of implications for people who have bedrooms with one window. I will oftentimes, as I will show you later, uh, transform the space for the child typically who lives in that room. It's also why corner offices are you know, reserved for the people who are really important. And there's a book on this, Places of the Soul by Christopher Day, and he covers a lot of other things as well. Well, one of my favorite things to address is what I call droopy dog windows. Uh, that's a way back reference to a cartoon that is really um, not one that you'd probably want to have your children see nowadays, but it was um, back in the 60s, you know, when I was growing up. And it's one of the main reasons light paths are diminished you raise the headers to connect to the light. You know, I put a box around the wall cabinets that were looking out at the backyard. You couldn't see the backyard. So a view pathway is blocked and the light pathway is blocked, especially because this was a north facing kitchen. And here I'm showing you how we raise the headers. This was in a, you're not able to do this on a single uh, story house. Uh, well, you can, I'll show you how I did it, but it's, it's a little tougher. And, and I'll um, bolt some steel, et cetera. But you, you, to raise the headers, you can go up into what's called the rim joist of the second floor. The second floor joists you can see there in the picture, they go out to the outer wall and they attach to what's called a rim joist. Well, you can remove that rim joist or alter it and move the header for the window up into that. In this case, we opted to not go all the way up to create an opening that would be big enough to put a vent through it for the hood. Now there's a code that says you cannot have an opening like this within three feet of an opening window. You cannot have a hood or you know out, out the back of your house. So 
I have developed a way of doing these large windows where I'll do a set of sliders across the bottom and have a large window up above. And my clients absolutely love this. Now you have to be really careful with the manufacturer you choose to do this because sometimes the way they mold these windows together, you'll end up with like six inches of wood between the upper large window and those two sliders that go before, you know, which are only a foot tall, you know, at the bottom. So one of my clients actually paid for a window to be, be uh, made three times before he finally found the manufacturer that gave him this narrow of a, of a uh, rail between the upper and the lower mullion between the two. So there's your before and there's your after. Wow, what a difference. Can you imagine? And now you stand at the sink and you completely enjoy your backyard, the north facing light, even though it's not the, the kind of light that uh, really floods the kitchen, but now the kitchen is flooded with light. And we also in the process had the doors custom made to go up to the same height, another product alteration that greatly benefited the overall look and feel of this space. You can do this on a traditional home, a two-story home. I raised the headers up and I put crown molding around the top of the window. And as you can see here, this still has a traditional feel, but it saved us the cost of trying to run crown molding and coffering and all kinds of other things around this room. So that actually paid for the, the window headers to be moved up. And I added the two windows you see there on either side of the fireplace to complete that overall effect. In this particular house, I mentioned earlier, one way of adding light into bedrooms, I will put a skylight in the hallway if it's possible, and it often is because bedrooms are usually on the second floor of, of homes. You can add a skylight out in the hallway and put these Clara Story type windows between the studs without running afoul of any kind of structural issues in probably 99% of the cases. The only time you have a problem on an exterior wall is if you're compromising a shear wall and a good competent con contractor can tell you whether that would be the case. And there's very rarely any, in fact, so far to date, I've never found any kind of issues, maybe occasionally a wire that's going up through there with power, but that's easily uh, hidden inside the new framing work that you're doing there. This is a kitchen where I did this again, a north facing kitchen. Can you imagine, just imagine if that had just been a wall with cabinets all the way to the ceiling. You know, sometimes people say, oh, I, don't, I can't live without the storage. Well, this kitchen has 36 inch deep counters with uh, 18 inch deep covers at the back like that. So everything here is accessible or within reach. All the small appliances are at the back of the counter. And this inspired the owner to go out and, and uh, get some art glass panels made to cover this. And so again, a way to change the feeling of a space, inspire emotions, you turn it into art and uh, instead of, of uh, just filling it with uh, cabinets to, to have more storage. Here was a condo where the master bath was completely locked into the middle of the condo with no light. But I walk the entire home. This is important. You know, when I go to visit someone, I, I literally walk every area of the house. And they go like, why are you doing this? We're just doing the kitchen. Well, I want to understand just how you interact with your home and how that affects what's going on in the kitchen that you may not understand right now, but we may uncover something. And in the end, that's something that matters. And remember what we're attempting to find out is what drove you to make the wish list and the things that most matter. And we may discover something by doing that. So when I walked into this room, initially I see, whoa, there's no light in this space other than what barely came in through the door. So I walked back out of the rest of the unit as walked around and saw that that wall was against the living room wall. By adding in these five clear story windows, I was able to bring amazing amounts of light into the master bath and it completely transformed the master bath. Now, the reason for that column-like element there on the left was that we actually expanded the bath into an adjacent uh, mechanical room to get to that light in the living room. In the process, we discovered all the elements from all of the other units. The uh, sanitary waste line was running down that particular wall. So we had to create a box around those elements. 
a different strategy again, um, these Claire store windows, but this in, the, in what case, how do you get, how do you handle the loss of all of that pantry when you're chasing a light path, getting light into this room from an east facing wall so that the morning light can come in and welcome you to greet the day? Well, the end result was this pro project right here. And you can see because of sheer walls and the rest, an initial concept to have multiple windows along that wall had to be reduced to just two windows. But we did carry that out into the outside uh, wall of the house, expanded the house actually out a little bit, added some steel around the top of those windows because they were narrow enough uh, windows, only three feet wide, I could do that. Now, this is a kitchen, if I understand how codes have been changed in Boston, I couldn't do in Boston because I, they tell me now that you can't have anything less than 18 inches above the counter. And here we had, uh, because of the height of the homeowner, and because that's mainly just a, a clearing counter for doing dishes, I dropped the wall cabinets to 10 inches off the counter. And they're also 15 inches deep, and the cabinets down below are 30 inches deep. And we'll get to that in a minute, because I break the free from the 1950s cabinet sizes they, when you do that, you increase counter space, you reduce clutter, and that's a deliberate misspelling, and you get more storage. Because the five things that most people complain about, I, I have an acronym called LAX. Layout, that's the L. A, aesthetics. K, uh, C for counter space. K for clutter. And S for storage. Layout, aesthetics, counter space, clutter, storage. It's not part of this seminar. It's part of another seminar, but uh, it's a freebie. But the, one of the most common complaints is, oh no, you're getting rid of my, I need the storage. Well, I took everything in that corner pantry, except for the oatmeal boxes and large bulky things like cereal boxes and uh, you know the chip bags. And I put that into one cabinet, 45 inches wide, 42 inches high, and 30 inches deep. And initially had only four pullouts in it, but then I told the owner, just lay things down in the drawer. You'll be able to see the labels, you'll be able to see what's there, and uh, you'll be able to condense the amount of things down. And she called me later and says, you're right, I could. And I figured out I could actually get a fifth pullout. And I had one made and I went and remounted the pullouts for her and stored literally everything that was in that pantry, except for those bulkier items in one single cabinet. I've used that strategy more than once. So when you break free from stock sizes, you increase counter space. And really, when you think about the typical industry cabinet, which is 24 inches deep, and then you put a counter on it, roughly 25, 25 and a quarter-ish, especially when you get the backsplash in there, you don't have more than about two feet of usable counter. And then you put things at the back of the counter, and now you're down to 16 inches of usable counter. And guess what? If you've taken your trainings, you know, and you've done your certification, you know that 16 inches is the minimum usable counter. Well, who wants the minimum usable counter in their kitchen? And so years ago, thanks to actually my clients in Juno, where I had a client who said, look, I want the walls for art and I want a big giant window for light because we are light deprived up here. And all winter long, I want something I like to look at on the wall. And I don't want to be looking at a bunch of cabinets. And I looked at her and I said, well, how are you going to, I asked, where are you going to put things? And she said, you're making the cabinets, you figure it out. And that was the first project I did where I actually did counters 36 inches deep with drawers that were 33 inches long with side mount Acuride 4037, uh, 4017 drawer guides, as I recall, along the sides. And stored what the architect had designed as a 25 box conventional 1950s data era boxes. With 25 boxes, I redid the kitchen with nine and uh, no wall cameras. And this was literally decades ago. And now it's now become the thing because why? Kitchens are the living room and everybody's in the living room and, and the living room is the kitchen. And now people want wall space so that they can have art on the walls, et cetera, et cetera. And another thing I do in virtually every kitchen I do, I'll point it out to you, again, wasn't really part of this seminar, but it's a problem solver. 
chef's drawers. You know, I'll pick, take the top two drawers and the second and third drawer, combine them, do a scoop side, and put all the elements that they most frequently use there. And you can see people use these drawers in very different ways. And lastly, the thing I do, I change that upper drawer height to seven and a half inches across the board. It cost me a hundred dollars again to just do a, a global modification at the cabinet shop where every drawer front is reprogrammed to come out on seven and a half inches, which allows me, as you can see, to have a uniform frame around that door, the drawer face. Typically in our industry, if you have a recessed panel or uh, drawer front, the style across the top and bottom of the drawer face is made like an inch and nine sixteenths, even though the side ones are two and a quarter inch. You know, because they, that's the only way you're going to get a pull in that. Well, if you make the drawer fronts seven and a half inches, you don't have that problem. And so I'm going to just say, when you use a 24 inch deep cabinet with the 21 inch undermount guides, yeah, your storage is greatly impacted because you only actually have about 19 and a half ish uh, interior drawer space front to back in your drawer. So yeah, you need more cabinets, you need a bigger kitchen. But beyond that, when you do an undermount drawer guide, you've made the drawer, we make the drawer a half inch less than ever before. And you imagine now you're giving your clients the shallowest drawer they've ever had. I say you because I'm not doing this, okay? I'm giving my clients drawers that are deep enough. You can put a two cup Pyrex measure in the drawer, or you can do like you saw here in the background behind that chef's drawer here. You can see there's actually a two layer drawer. I did a pull out inside of a drawer that goes out the back of the drawer for a two layer drawer. Because I have a process I do with my clients where I have a hundred items in seven different categories and it's kind of the micro reverse engineer pro uh, process because every item has a use attached to it. And initially we're shaping the space around use. All right, so that's what I'm gonna say about that. Um, <clears throat> so people pathways, when you wanna aim the client in a new direction, so I wanna say again, stay with the process, keep ideas as placeholders. Remember the reactions are information as you discover what most matters. But there's a fourth principle, what I call the three uns. Unfamiliar, unexpected ideas will create uncertainty. I should just say will, not can. Why? Because that's the way our brains, again, are wired. When something unfamiliar and unexpected happens, it could be a sound, like when Stravinsky's Rites of Spring was premiered, the sounds he was playing were so unfamiliar, so unexpected, it literally triggered fear, flight, flight in the uh, audience and they scrambled, they rioted to get out of the auditorium. It's this profound the way our amygdalas work. And then at, not long after that, he was touted as the genius he was. So people pathways really trigger a whole different strategy altogether. That's why I walk the house. Uh, where do you start your journey to the kitchen? From the garage or from the front door? Or where is it that the groceries come into the house, I'll ask. What's the line of travel? Where's the destination for these things? What do you see along the way? And I often find stairs are the worst offender and I often find stairs are not code, code compliant. Like when I did my daughter's house in Lynn, Massachusetts, those stairs were the farthest thing from code compliant. So and I walked into this bungalow. There was, it was a north facing kitchen. As you can see, two doors into the kitchen, a little eating nook off to the side. And I said to them, well, what if we just change the stairs to go down the outside of the wall there instead? And they said, well, how are we gonna get to the basement if you do that? You know, and I said, because you couldn't, you'd, you'd walk right into a mechanical room and they certainly were gonna deal with that. We, we wanna keep the stairs the way they are in the basement. How can you do that? And I said, well, I'm just gonna make the island deep enough that you can walk under the island as you go down to, this, to the basement. And those upper two drawers are functional, but the door below it isn't, it's a fake one. And the bottom drawers of the island are also fake as you descend. So they, this island was one where you could walk underneath the island on the way down. And uh, there's a bit of a code issue here because you can see there's no railing issue. But Seattle's kind of unique because Seattle was incorporated as a city before Washington became a state. So they can actually do whatever they want when it comes to code compliance. And the inspector saw this and goes, oh, I love what you did. I'm not gonna write you up for this. 
So we were able to get away with a tread that literally walks out on top of the appliance garage. And in the process to make that pathway happen, change, we had to add a dormer to the outside of the house and that created a new light path, which brought light in from the east. Now this of course is raising the cost of the project exponentially. And then I add in, well, this north face kitchen, let's move the header up into the rim joist to, and create this arc. Now, if you're looking carefully, you'll realize that the sink is not centered on the window, but I reconciled that using shape. That's a whole nother seminar on, on fractals and other things and how they affect us. Um, another pathway, I walk around this house and I walk down the stairs. There's a main one in the entryway. There's a back one that literally walked out the outside of the house to the deck. And I looked at this, I walk around, I'm thinking, this is, this is nuts because it was by flipping the stairs coming down from the bungalow, the, the dormer up above, I said to the client, you can bring light into the middle of the kitchen. You can see how we did the stairs there. And, and because we flipped them, that also created an eating nook over there in the corner. And beyond that, now light comes down in the middle of the kitchen. This is a kitchen that's about mm, 16 years old. And I still love the way it feels. And, and, all. and this is the whole point of, of when you shape a space to the feelings of timeless, it, they are timeless to the people who are in that space. And then that's the classic way I hide a sub-zero. I put a drawer face across the bottom of the door. And then I have the two drawers faces, fake ones above it, and then that. So if you look at that carefully, you'll see the two drawers that are hidden, and then you'll see the fake one at the bottom of the door, and one of those knobs is where you grab to open that door. A little bit of a freebie here in this uh, webinar. Fun to do, totally hides the refrigerators when you do that. Do it all the time. So looking at the other side of the kitchen, that's your before, now here's the after. I discovered what mattered to her as we talked about this and I'm outside. She said, oh, I love my garden. And do you realize she said, everything in my garden is edible. I'm like, are you kidding? Well, you need to have a potting bench in your kitchen. How would you feel about having a potting bench? She says, what, are you kidding? I, you know, and I, so that's what I did for her. And uh, this, of course this house has since sold, but it sold like, just like that. People walk in, people pay, a premium for things that feel different, feel right, feel distinctive, feel unique. Another kitchen which had all three of these issues, nice, lovely kitchen. But when I walk through the house, I come into the kitchen and I've just been looking out at beautiful views of the golf course. And you go in the kitchen, you couldn't even see it unless you leaned over the kitchen sink. When I walked into it, they had just moved in, boxes were strewing everywhere. And then I proposed, let's remove that, uh, let's open up that wall. And of course, the very most common complaint is, what are you gonna do for storage? Here's the after. I transform closets to the end of the room into some storage. And if you notice, that's a, that uh, the floor was so out of level, I actually moved the kitchen a foot off the floor to hide that and put mirror down in the space below. And again, the advantage of deeper than the industry standard cabinets, I end up with all the pots and pans they had in one drawer. And again, you see that chef's drawer. And then you see a banquette under there and we got TV trays and people fight over who gets the uh, Flintstone or the Jetson TV tray when they come to visit. Here was the way I walked into the kitchen. I walked in through the living room area. It's all blocked off, no communication between. I took a mechanical room and changed it into, discovered what mattered to them was wine. I proposed changing the, to mechanical room, moving that needed to be uh, updated anyway. And so I discovered that and I said, well, let's just move it if we're gonna update it anyway and turn this into something that features wine. And that actually has an acrylic floor in it with color shifting light under it. If you've been paying attention, you saw earlier that the light was blue. Here are my principles, how I hand it to my client. I'd be happy to share that with anybody who wants it. Just reach out to me later. I'm gonna unlock this design using view, light, and people. It was a young family, Korean family, four girls under 10, split well home. People pathways, imagine having five bodies, four little girls in this space, how much congestion there was. 
the pathways, the view looking out the yard, very limited. The light pathways very confined. So I proposed removing all the walls down and making the window eight foot wide. And of course, ah, where are you going to put all the storage? Well, here's what we did. There's an example that they had to justify the cost of adding a really big beam that, of course, affected the basement as well, or the lower floor, I should say. And then I proposed a stainless steel counter with a custom sink and a drain bore behind it. So now it's tuned to the light and people of pathways. And here's the coat, and there's that drain board behind the sink, how you can modify it. Now that stainless steel, I will tell you, is not your normal stainless steel. I do what's called an orbital finish. Other people have different names for it. Basically, they take an orbital sander and they put little concentric circles in it around it. It makes the feel of the stainless and the look of the stainless uh, feel like cotton candy. But I did this also deliberately to hide the things or at least sequester them when, you know, this is a very, very open kitchen. And it feels different to not to have things out on the drain board, but to have them back there behind the sink. There's the rice cooker. Everything was sized to handle that. I also have been, uh, developed and happy to share the design for diagonal pullouts in the corner. Those aren't your industry standard 12 inch, 12 inch doors in that corner. Those are 14 by 14. And that gives you a 17 inch wide pullout, which as you can see, uh, makes it very usable. It also makes the opening wide enough that it's quite easy to reach the triangular you know, triangular shelves that are in the corner. And I've evolved this now to actually where I can make that middle shelf adjustable with a pullout on it. Very cool. So let's go back to finish with the last uh, three pathways here. Sound, smell, and touch. Sound, there's a lot of uh, noise fatigue now in our lives. And there's a lot of quieting materials that are available. Acoustic block, quiet rock, quiet bat, bats, uh, the best if you have a little bit of more room uh, to play with the ceilings and walls is hush frame, go look it up. Uh, it's astonishing how much uh, noise transmission re re reduced between rooms with that. Qu equipment, we all know dishwashers have been quieted enormously. But what about counters? You know, the quietest material for a counter, there's two of them. I'm gonna start with wood counters. That's the one you're most familiar with. And I point out to people that uh, they're warm, they're quiet, and they're not, there's no glare. In this kitchen, I love to use wood counters, you know, mostly and primarily for where people's uh, eating bars are, but I have used them as kitchen counters as well. And you can see in that little detail shot, you know, we get a copper accent on it. <clears throat> Excuse me, in this kitchen, uh, we did a, and it's a wonderful opportunity to add a detail. Uh, this is, a, is an example of how you, you get more social seating. Uh, at this point in my career, I really completely reject what I call stranger seating, where you have four or five people sitting on the road at the back of an island. You still see people doing that. Uh, that's not social one bit. You end up with people acting like chickens in a barn, you know, heads bobbing up and down trying to talk to people that are sitting two or three people away. It's called stranger seating for a reason. So at least wrap the seating around the end of the island. <clears throat> and you can see in this kitchen how I reconciled two different people's height. The woman was five foot four, the husband was six foot six. I don't know how this happens, it seems to happen a lot. And by creating a, a seven inch tall block of Jatoba, I had to have custom made, that's where the husband works in the kitchen. You can also see that they like to cook together. Uh, not many cooktops anymore have the controls down the side. There are a few, and that's what drove our, our cooktop. And here the counters again were stainless. Why? Because I had to make a sink that could be usable from both sides. And you can see if you look closely that the uh, garbage uh, control switch is right there in the divider between the two sinks. And there also there's a 40 foot long library ladder around this kitchen. And this was taken before there was things up there to display. And you can also see if you took any other of my seminars, <clears throat> the concept of self-similarity between the arcs, the arc of the window, the arc in the uh, Futong Chen hood, the arc at the end of the island, the arc in the faucet, there's a connection between shapes that share a common characteristic yet are different in kind. 
I use wood a lot of times for uh, covers and bathrooms. Now, this was a bathroom I had to relocate the powder room, actually in the same kitchen we just saw, to create room for things. And by using a narrow trough sink and a, a wall-mounted faucet, uh, you know, I was able to do that. The brass mesh concealed all the security panels and the other equipment that was there, and we didn't want to relocate it. I will caution you that when you put faucets on the wall like this, uh, you, there's a tremendous amount of noise that goes into the other room. So do pay attention to sound blocking. Now the switch materials in this kitchen, <clears throat> again, I walked the house, I walked down over the basement where that arrow is with a step down to a landing. Uh, you've seen many of the older homes had this where you'd walk down three or four steps and you're at a, a door to the outside. You'd have a landing and then you turn and you go down into the basement uh, level of the home. And that cabinet that's decorated there is actually one we had to build in the room. We had to assemble it in the room because that's actually over the stairs as you go down to the basement. Well, that freed up the room so where I didn't need any wall cabinets on that other side of the room. And this, I had to have this uh, sketched for the client because it's actually a three uh, focus points uh, uh, on it. There's not just one uh, to make it look right. And you can see that there's uh, we, the, the woman whose kitchen this was wanted to keep all the original cabinetry but wanted a dishwasher. So by flipping the kitchen and doing the things that I did, I was able to add a Fisher Pranko dish drawer, a small little sink next to the cooktop, and then we did rich light counters, which many people don't know about. They're a Northwest company. company. Uh, go in and research them. They have some wonderful materials. Again, it's warm, quiet, and no glare surface. And then what about smell? You know, odor's presence in our lives. It's, it, there's a new form of ventilation that's parametric. And I think many of you may have noticed these things. These are the units, Zephyr Lux. It's uh, narrow slots around the unit speed up the air and it sucks it off the ceiling. The Faber uh, Isola, the Sears, the future of the foreign of the best. I will warn you that only one of these units can be put into a shallow cavity of a, of a floor joist system you, without having to build down a soffit or doing some other modification to the structure. The only one that can be built into a very shallow uh, floor system is the serious one, the way it's designed. Uh, this is a kitchen where I use that to do a two island kitchen. Again, you see a custom stainless sink that goes across an island, which is the main working area. You can see where they're cooking is the wood, and you can see that's uh, social seating around the island. Here's a way to isolate. I'm doing quite a lot of projects with a scullery, where a room off the kitchen, the butler's pantry, or whatever you'd like to call it, becomes a working room. We put in the ovens, and we put a blower to extract air out. So when things spill over and call acrid smoke or you do in-house cremation, um, self-cleaning, and you have all that smell, you have a way to control it. In this house, I uh, was a lake house. And the entry of the house is where that oval is. It used to be there because I asked. I said, people pathways, do people come to your front door? No, they never do. They always come to this door and walk straight into the kitchen. I said, so why not turn your entry into a walk-in pantry? And why not put a, a range in there for when you're doing uh, more stinky things? And that's exactly what we did. And you notice the hood. Where's the hood? Uh, it actually pulls out. I do a lot of these. Uh, I have them made. It's basically an upside down knee hole drawer that you pull out when you need to use it and you push it back when you don't. I'd be happy to share my designs for that. Basically, it's a knee hole drawer without the back on the back of the drawer. In this project, uh, because the kitchen is a living room, again, we wanted a little bit of art in the kitchen. And I brought in some light from a west facing window, shaping again the space around light paths, dramatically affected how the cabinets came together. And there again is my uh, pull out hood. And, and in this case, you can see the mesh there on the outside of the house is a remote blower. And I do this a lot of times too, because the hood lighting is different in Kelvin temperature than the under cabinet lighting. And sometimes the hood lighting is, in fact, a lot of times it's 4,000 Kelvin and doesn't match the under cabinet lighting. So by making my own hoods, I actually am able to keep the lighting all consistent. And lastly, touch. We've talked about that before. 
and matte and glossy. They're totally connected to your visual neurons. In this project, when people walked in, I wanted a place that welcomed them. That's the feeling of a hug. It's a nine foot long counter out of tulip wood. People love to come and they immediately sit down and start conversing with the people that are in the kitchen. And this project uh, is about touch again, uh, texture, especially if this is all the way it looked before. This is the after, because the woman who owned this kitchen wanted to remove or over, if they put something over the face of all this brick on the fireplace. And I said to her, the problem isn't the brick. The problem is, is you don't have any other texture other than in the living room. This, you know, to balance it, but the rest of it, as you can see from those other three pictures, is just this wood paneling. There's nothing that balances it. So by flooding the space with texture, you can see it on the, the top of the stools, you can see it on the cabinet faces, you can see it on that mosaic on the backsplash, you can see it in the cabinet doors. There's actually perforated stainless steel. The view pathway into the kitchen when you walked in, the first thing you saw was stain that stainless refrigerator. So by surrounding it with stainless steel and softening the stainless with those perforations, I dissipated the bulkiness of the refrigerator by modifying that and by using heavily corded uh, art glass, I added more texture to where this is a kitchen with very little wood in it. And yet it has that wood-like feel. So Create a disruption. When you want to aim the client in an inspiring direction, you have to reveal what most matters. And getting people to respond to these six pathways requires you, really does, to have these rules, principles. Stay with me in the process. Don't throw me out the door because I've given you an idea that's completely disrupted and you think it's going to cost too much. Your know, reactions are information as we discover what most matters. And just remember, something unfamiliar and unexpected is going to create uncertainty. But in the end, what matters isn't going to be the budget. What's going to matter is whether you can justify spending money on this project. And I will tell you that when I moved to this approach, the year after I did this, my income doubled. How would you like to have that happen? Double my income because people sensed I was going to be their advocate in this process. I wasn't just there to de design and build something. I was there to serve their interests, to uncover all the pressure points that could be affecting this design and to give them something that resolved that in a way that transformed their space, visually satisfied them functionally, but most important, inspired them emotionally. And when we do this, when I do this, I've had clients increase their budget two, three, even five times because they are so inspired. And one of the only ways that I can explain this is to explain in the context of asking my client, how often do you expect to get married? <laughs> and they said, well, yeah, only once. And I said, yeah. And my daughter spent five times what I would have spent on a wedding because she could justify it. And people, when they change their home, are often going to do it for only once in their life. So if you transform the space visually and satisfy them functionally, yep, they're going to stay to budget. Yet when you inspire them and offer them a design that inspires them emotionally, be prepared to watch the floodgates open because they get excited about this is going to be such a major event in their life. And they're going to share it with so many people. They don't want to come up short when it comes to the end of it and have regrets. So use six pathways to unlock your designs and make your clients inspired emotionally in the process. Thank you for attending. Debbie, questions? Yes, Richard, thank you so much. You've had a lot of great comments here going on in the, uh, the chat that you've, you're very creative, uh, beautiful and bril brilliantly uh, done. So let's get to the questions. We've got quite a few. So Carrie, she wanted to know back in the beginning. So these are all chronological, Richard. Sure. Car Carrie, who was the author of the book, um, Emotional Design? If you look for that title under, uh, it's Donald Norman. You will find that book and you'll actually find some amazing videos on YouTube. They're worth watching, not all Norman, as he explains things. Uh, that's the beautiful thing about YouTube. Uh, you can see him explaining this. And uh, 
Yeah. And what was his last name again, Richard? Donald Norman. Donald Norman. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Another great book is uh, House as a Mirror of Self, Claire Cooper Marcus, because in the end, she says what we're attempting to do is reconcile two people's points of view on how life should be lived, but it's completely grounded in their place history. That's a whole nother webinar. <laughs> Uh, well, someone just put a comment in here and they should that you, sh you should have a YouTube channel and an um, Instagram <laughs> account. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to keep going with the questions. Yeah, so Stephen said, so back in the beginning, you were talking about that, that wish list. And so yeah. he, he wanted to know, can you give an example of what that would look like? What, what, what would lead you to create a wish list or have your client create? Well, the, 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 things I, the five things that you're going to find on a wish list are typically uh, a layout issue, uh, an aesthetic issue, you know, this is just plain worn out, the kitchen looks ugly, doesn't fit us, we don't like it, you know, all those kind of things. Uh, we've been on Pinterest, we've been on House, uh, you know, we've been clipping, 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 clipping. And, you know, unfortunately, House and Pinterest actually memorialize what is, in my view, out of date already. Uh, I will tell you that at the high end of the business, Remember when granite was high end and now you buy, you can get granite counters at the big box stores and, and all. That the high end of the business, what's happening is cabinets are getting made deeper. Uh, Pogan Paul, their USA standard box now is 25 and three quarters deep for a 25 inch upper, for instance, because they recognize that you now need to put more below when you're going to free up the walls for art and to not have this feeling like you're, you're in this crowded box full of cabinets in order to accomplish storage. So layout aesthetics, and you've seen in these examples how much, every one of these examples you've seen uh, has had deeper cabinets in them and to increase the storage down below. Uh, I will tell you that even only adding one inch, if you know what you're doing to a cabinet, will give you three inches more usable in the front to back use of the drawer. If you have questions about that, please reach out to me. But layout aesthetics, counter space, clutter, and storage. That's an acronym, L-A-C-K-S. Wish lists will always fall, in my experience, under one of those. And the two most common ones actually are, you know, of course, aesthetics, and you know, but you, storage. Anytime I propose removing wall cabinets or simplifying and opening up the walls, adding windows, immediately people say, oh, I can't lose the storage. I can't lose the storage. And I say, Rule one, stay with the process until we figure out what most matters and be assured I have the secondary process where we're gonna go through hundred items in seven categories and put everything away. So layout aesthetics, counter space, clutter and storage. Okay, so CJ um, wanted to know, how do you approach clients that don't have uh, views that um, to utilize? That's where the art comes in. That's where art comes in, yeah. That's a great way to bring in art or potentially do like you saw in that one kitchen, where, which in fact, uh, if we had added windows on the east wall, remember that kitchen with the corner pantry that I replaced with one cabinet? One of the reasons why I just went with those small Claire Story windows was when they looked out that side of the house, they saw things they did not want to see. So by just adding Claire Story windows around the kitchen, you could potentially add more light. I, you know, we live in Seattle where I'm at here. And if you want to win a bar bet, just bet somebody roughly how many people in Canada live south of Seattle as a percentage or a fraction. And people never get this right. It's literally two thirds of people in Canada live south of us here in Seattle. Toronto is south of Seattle. Hmm. And so we're very really light starved here. It's already getting dark uh, around four o'clock here. So opening up spaces to light, uh, you know, from two different sky colors. I'm kind of obsessive about that because it does trigger positive reactions in our brains. You can't help it. You will feel better if you can introduce light in any way, shape or form, even if it's indirectly like you saw in that bathroom where you put clear story windows high in a wall from an adjoining space. So it's pretty rare that you find a kitchen in which you can't add more light or bring and increase the feeling of it without somehow creating a different pathway for that room. Oh, thank you, Richard. And so who was the, um, the maker for those deeper cabinets that you talked about earlier? It's a small cabinet company actually in uh, Chehalis, Washington. 
they're basically only West Coast aristocrat cabinets, aristocrat, you know, not aristocrat, um, it's aristocratic. They were the West Coast first computer driven um, manufacturing cabinet shop in the little town of Chihuahua, halfway between, it is a little town between Seattle and Portland. Uh, now virtually all the major manufacturers are. The problem you will have is finding ones that are willing to break away from the how locked in they are to six inch high drawer faces and 24 inch boxes. But keep at it, believe me, they're out there. You will pay a premium for things to be changed. What I do is I just itemize all the boxes as stock sizes and I show them I'm right there competitive with everybody else and you just want to buy the box. Yet, and I always use the word yet, never but, yet uh, you will find if you change and add the space and we resolve it and we get you all this wonderful, wonderful storage and six stacks of pots and pans can fit in your pots and pans drawer, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to probably add, and I show them over on another column because I put it all on a spreadsheet. It typically adds another 50%, but I'd have people willingly spend because they see where the money's going and can therefore, keyword, justify the cost. They will spend up to 100% more on their cabinet package, which is one way I doubled what I make in any particular given year was because my cabinet packages actually got much larger, but people could justify spending it. They got much more expensive, I should say. And I was able to maintain my margins because they're not out there competing. In fact, my clients never get other people's bids on things because they sense I'm there as their advocate for, the, for what they're doing. I'm looking out for them in ways because I'm the only one who's talking about and finding what most matters. Everybody else is focused on the wish list. Okay, so uh, there was a while back where you were, you had a lot of freestanding bathtubs there, and mm -hmm. um, Sunali says uh, that this person feels that they are lack practicality, like water spills. What are your thoughts on those freestanding bathtubs? I mean, do you find that the clients are, are having water spills, etc.? Well, I wouldn't have seven clients have these tubs with no, and I'm talking across the spectrum of lifestyles and homes uh, that have these type of. Uh, bathtubs and I have not once heard they've had an issue with water spillage. I think most of them keep a towel handy and they put it on the floor for when they get out of the bathtub. Okay. I haven't asked that question, but I would suspect that's what they're doing. <laughs> All right. And then a while back you had the, uh, the stainless steel finish on those countertops. Mm -hmm. Can you um, mention the details of that finish on that stainless steel, please? Yeah, yeah I, I find different companies call it different things, but effectively uh, it's orbital. And I think if you searched for orbital finish stainless steel, you would find some images in uh, your, uh, your Google search or whichever search engine you're using, Edge or otherwise. Uh, you'll, I think you'll find uh, orbital finish will give you some examples, but just imagine, an orbital sander like a cabinet shop uses it make, makes little dinky swirls in the in the cabinet uh, the counter finish and i will tell you my wife absolutely hates stainless steel because of a, a hospitalization earlier in her life and yet after a weekend at a home that had stainless steel counters with this finish on it she came and said i love those counters what were they she didn't even recognize they were stainless steel and she was appalled when i told her they were stainless steel honey <laughs> And she says, no, so, it's, it's really transformative. You know, when you break up the surface, like why home surfaces and granite and et cetera are now more and more popular is you break up that tactile nature of it. Literally, it does feel warmer to the touch than when you have a totally smooth, glossy surface. So that's another reason why, you know, we, we want to, you know, switch to more of these home finishes, et cetera, especially with quartz and other materials like that. Okay, you showed uh, early, uh, earlier on um, the deeper cabinets and mm -hmm. someone wanted to know the maker for those deeper cabinets. Yeah, well, I just said aristocratic cabinets out of Chehalis, Washington, but they only <laughs> serve the West Coast. Yet I will tell you any good company that makes custom cabinetry, well, you just need to find out what they're gonna charge you for the engineering and the cost for those drawer guides. This is why I itemize it. Um, you know, I'm paying like $75 premium per drawer for those drawer guys because they don't come in in the typical industry standard 21 inch box car quantities. 
uh, it's starting to change. I know that our local, uh, you know, Bloom uh, supplier now stocks these longer ones, maybe just because of me, but I doubt it. I think it's because it's beginning to take hold at the custom end of the market. So that's the, so that is one of your sources for the, yes. the longer yeah. glides is Bloom? Yeah, but I will tell you another cabinet company that's out here, I won't name names. I was one of the starting people who was their mo most major dealer when they started up. But after a while, they asked me to no longer sell their cabinets because as I said, you change everything on a cabinet. I said, yeah, who wants a little shallow top drawer? Why can't you just be happy with a six inch top drawer and a 24 inch box? Everybody else is. <laughs> and I said, well, everybody else can. Now it's a $60 million a year cabinet company, so it's working. But I don't want to be in that space. You know, it's just me. I, I want to maximize my clients, you know, as we say in our family, I want the maximum possible positive points for my clients. Okay, so let's keep going. I, I have a couple more uh, before because we are definitely over time, and anyone that needs to leave is is more than welcome. But I, I, I want to, to, or you can call me later, contact me later. My website's okay. down there. Send me an email, leave me a message on my phone, whatever. So. Great. So, so someone Barbara was asking, how do you sell? Um, using wood to your clients because most people fear using it. It's warm and it's quiet and it has no glare. I had a project I could show you pictures of Barbara there. Uh, the client grew up on the East Coast, his wife didn't. And uh, the way I unlocked the design was actually kind of funny. I talked about pathways, of course. And I said, then when growing up, did you ever go look through, um, you know, like key, you know, keyhole doors, they had keyholes in this old East Coast house. And he said, oh yeah, I used to try to peek through the doors, you know, and, and see what was inside. And I couldn't, but I, I like to pretend I could, whatever. Anyway, so that shape, you know, people are shape sensitive at eight days old. So these shapes get imprinted. So I did a nine foot island in the shape of a giant keyhole with a five foot diameter keyhole at the end in solid walnut. And the wife said, oh no, you know, it's gonna get all scratched and it's gonna get all dinged and it's gonna go, all, you know, bent up, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, you know what, that may be true, but it will be just like a story stick, you know, in certain cultures. You're gonna have know the story behind every nick and every ding that happens. And when your grandchildren come and they do that, you're, you're gonna, you just rub some more oil on it and it'll be okay. Or if it really gets bad, we can resurface it, no problem. <laughs> Later I went back and she laughed. She says, you know, you're absolutely right. This, this little thing here, that came when Susie was over here visiting. And this little thing here, it just reminds me now of all of my kids and how grandkids and how important they are in my life. So, you know, not for everybody. Yet I can also tell you, I've seen European magazines, not recently, I will tell you, because we've moved beyond some things. But I remember once opening a magazine from Europe and I have visited people in Europe and they have wood counters. Okay, um, so there was a brand of hood uh, in the kitchen where, that you talked about where the husband was six foot and the wife was five foot four. Uh, that was Cheng, Cheng Design. Okay. Yeah, and that's um, Zephyr carries and, those. And doesn't uh, someone, uh, Russell was asking, doesn't Bosch make a pullout hood now? No one makes a pullout hood that works with you have 15 inch deep cabinets and my pullouts come all the way past even the front edge of the counter. So when you're talking effective isolation of the odors and extraction, I've had people use those ones, Russell, and then they wish they had had one made like I do because they don't come out far. And they actually, that one kitchen that had that corner pantry that I replaced with the she actually used a stock one like that and then complained later about how, how much of the smoke and vapors escaped from uh, being collected. And so I so wish I just had you make the hood like you described. Okay, and then Serena said that she liked the wall mount bath faucets that um, you were showing there, but she was wondering if there are any issues um, if they're placed on an exterior wall. No, no, it would function quite well. I'm still looking for someone who does that for the single hole with a one command, you know, faucet. If anybody finds one, let me know. <laughs> There's probably one out there. I just haven't found it yet. But for, if that client was okay with the British faucet. Yeah, someone, oh, oh, thank you. So someone, Jacqueline was asking about the, we're going back to the cabinets for a second, the deeper base offset tall box charge. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what she's asking here. 
Um, yeah, like I said, I, one reason I, I itemize things and I translate it over and put it in a spreadsheet is so I can do this is I first start with a stock box. Even aristocratic has a whole catalog full of stock boxes. So I enter all that pricing in and that's my, what I say, my base sticker. And I tell people, here's your base sticker. If, I, if you went to the big box store, I can do your kitchen for this. And, and in fact, usually it's less than what they can get at that, at, at, in those uh, places. But here's all the things that you've discovered really most matter to you. Storage-wise, what it does, how this transforms the space visually, uh, satisfies you functionally, inspires you to have this kind of open design, like the one here on the screen where I could put light above the cabinets, under the cabinets, and uh, that actually counters 30 inches deep. I managed to fit a sink that would be 45 inches of cabinet in a stock box into a 30 inch wide cabinet. It's a full single sink with half a double sink next to it. The full single sink goes front to back. And one more time, what is the brand to that custom pull out hood? <laughs> uh, well, I make them, uh, is what I do. I have a metal shop make them, cost me $1,200. Okay. Uh, round numbers. You know, sometimes a little more depending on the width. And I've made them up to five feet wide. Uh, I change them all the time. And some I've added uh, a matching wood piece to the front edge of it. Uh, you, know, you know, there's no set way I do it. Just a set concept. A pull out upside down drawer with no back on it. And we so put it, lighting across the back, you know, using the LED strip lights. And we just tie that right into the under cabinet lighting. Okay, so a designer would need to find a metal shop to work with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You could use my metal shop. I mean, he could, you know, uh, Metal Masters in Linwood, Washington, and he already knows how to do it, and he could ship it to you. You know, just talk with me first so I can get you, <laughs> take your design. I did this for a designer in New York. So, okay. um, you know, so it can be done. You know, Great. if you're motivated enough to do it. I'm Great. Well, to help. That's great, Richard. This has been wonderful. Um, uh, we've certainly gone over time. I, I apologize, uh, but most of people, quite a few people, stood in here with us. About 140 of them. So that's nice. Awesome. <laughs> and um, so obviously we've been recording. And once again, I want to thank you, Richard, for all of your great ideas. The, the chat box here has been great, just filling up with um, lots of really complimentary things for you, and and how inspiring this webinar has been, and how inspiring you are. Oh, and, uh, again, we want to thank Everett for their generous sponsorship and uh, thank you again. Tip off my hat to you, Richard. <laughs> All right, Debbie, thanks. See you next year. Thank you. All right. Oh, have wait, a you should put a plug in. We have a seminar at uh, Cadmus, uh, the virtual one. That's I have to right. record that before the, something like the 14th this month. So okay. I'm going to get on it. <laughs> That's right. Well, thank you again. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day.